Podcast. It's Monday. It's November 7th. And the word of the day is sequacity, which means the readiness to follow a person or cause without applying any independent judgment. Huh. Used in a sentence, sequacity, sequacity, God shed his grace on them. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right. So, hey, $100 to the first person that convinces their shitty conservative hometown to change its name to Sequa City. Yeah, okay. get in there, people. <laughs> <laughs> I'm no illusions. I'm Eli Bosnick. I'm Ethan Wright. And broadcasting delayed from America's Far Center, we are the Skeptocrats. On this week's episode, Lulu Da doing democracy stuff. <laughs> Elon Musk literally borrows our oddly charming giving away a free thing business model. <laughs> and Andrew Torres has some helpful tips on how to set up your panic room on Tuesday night. But first, the rest of the intro music. Joining me for headlines tonight are my fellow skeptic rats, No Illusions, and Eli Bosnick. Gentlemen, election day is nigh. So let's get some predictions. In 2023, who controls the House, who controls the Senate, and by how many seats in each one? Keith, what do you think? I, I keep telling you, the elections are on the even-numbered years. Okay. He okay. oh just doesn't right. pay attention. So, much. so I have I have the, the Dems picking up one in the Senate, um, but admittedly, that's because it would be hard to hear me if I had to spend the whole episode breathing into a paper bag. So. <laughs> <laughs> also, 2022 is an even year. Yeah, election. it is. It is. But um, um, we should announce before we start something very important. Vulgarity for Charity has begun. Ooh, ooh! So check it out. That is our charity fundraiser along with Tom and Cecil from Cogdis. All you have to do, go to modestneeds.org, make a donation of $50 or more, and then send us the receipt for that at vulgarityforcharity, all spelled out, at gmail.com. Tell us who you'd like us to roast. If it's not a famous person, send us a picture, give us some details about the roastee, and we'll uh, possibly be putting you on the air. We're going to do 200 roasts. 100, which will be the top 100 donors by dollars, and then another 100 randomly chosen. Go ahead and get those donations in early, and you have a better shot, because we're going to do those random drawings starting right away. Come on, people. All right. In our lead story tonight, we have some election news from a few different places, actually. I'll start with some good asterisk, but yeah, it's definitely good news out of Brazil, where atmospheric carbon enthusiast Jair Bolsonaro will not continue serving as president after losing last week's election to leftist rival Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva of the Workers' Party. After the final tally was announced by the election officials, it took Bolsonaro about 45 hours before he made any public remarks, and those remarks did not include the words, I concede, mm. or something synonymous, which makes Bolsonaro... Well, an extremely gracious loser in American terms. <laughs> extremely <laughs> gracious. I get how the Brazilian population might be concerned by this, but your right-wing nationalist asshole is literally two years and counting ahead of our guy in terms of conceding <laughs> elections. <laughs> Fucking relax over there. You're fine. Yeah. Yeah, no, Lula's biggest advantage in this election was how quaint his corruption seems compared to Bolsonaro's, like, actual policies. The Brazilian voters Yeah, that like, was the oh, asterisk. Psh, fucking buy-in parliamentary votes. That's not even genocidal. Yeah, you know, that guy's it's so not, great. though. It's not directly that. Correct. It, was, it was super weird to read the news about how Bolsonaro was defeated by his far more liberal opponent when they met Lula. This this must be how Brits feel when they read about our elections. Right? <laughs> like, yeah. Famous liberal Joseph Biden. <laughs> yeah. So the new president-elect of Brazil, he often goes by just the one name, Lula, which is a great power move, and right. I support anything that angers the Bolsonarians. Speaking of which, a whole bunch of lunatic right-wing nationalists are protesting all over Brazil, yeah. blocking highways and bridges, with some even calling for a violent coup to stop Lula from taking over. Yeah, those go great, guys. Go for it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, for his part, Bolsonaro told the protesters to keep doing their thing, but just don't break stuff too much or, or try to hang anyone, which... Again, sounds like a delightfully smooth transition of power <laughs> in a fully functional democracy. You're fucking fine, Brazil. Bolsonaro is 
not contesting the results, and he authorized his chief of staff to begin cooperating with the incoming administration. That already happened. He might as well be riding a tandem bike with Lula and then making out while they have a picnic in a field together. Sounds delightful over there. Bolsonaro even said, I'll abide by the Constitution and hand over power on January 1st. Just delightful. It's amazing what's happening over there. This is what a right-wing nationalist fascist should look like. So... Okay, that's a weird note, mm-hmm. but it's not my fault given the relative <laughs> no. things that are happening here, too. Just look, all political takes at this point in history are weird notes, okay? Yeah. yeah. Our jobs <laughs> used to be so much harder, podcast listeners. <laughs> we had right. Now we just say. We just say what yep, happened. That pretty much does it. Yep. Just name the things. And speaking of right wing nationalism, Israel is about to have a brand new prime minister. Huh. His name, yeah, new guy. His name is Benjamin Netanyahu. Maybe you heard of him. Yeah. Uh, apparently his 5,560 days of previous oh, prime Jesus ministering, Christ. that was okay as a trial run, but the conservative majority of Israel wants to really give him a chance to get his feet under him, you know, and really dig into some policy. Now, in fairness, he is bringing a new perspective to the table. This is not the milk toast liberal Palestine-friendly BB nets that you remember from those other... 15 and a half years of being prime minister. He'll be forming the most arch conservative government in Israel since like Ramses the <laughs> second. Okay. Well, I'm thinking about it. Ramses the second, let the people go. So it's yeah, not right. like clear. <laughs> the comparison I just made. Netanyahu's coalition will include his conservative Likud party, Shaz, United Torah Judaism, and also the religious Zionism slash Jewish power bloc with approximately 65 out of 120 seats in the Knesset. And an Arab alliance called Hadash Tal is going to have about five seats. And I'm assuming those seats are located beyond a fence within that Knesset area. We'll see how it goes. Uh, Hey, guys, could a few of our coalitions not sound like the things Kanye shouts as he's strapped to a gurney? No? (laughs) Okay. Well, we'll go with United Torah Judaism and Jewish power block. That's fine. (laughs) And now that we've covered some excellent democracy in action, that's going to bring us to the United States where we have something else. I don't know. Something (laughs) democracy in action. (laughs) That's excellent. (laughs) We kind of do. Joe Biden, he actually gave a whole dedicated speech last week that basically just said, "Okay, okay, guys, we're we're doing an election again. Remember those? I, I know they're kind of tricky for you. Is everyone cool ahead of time? I feel like I should just ask this. Is it cool if we count the votes and then the winners get to win? Is that cool? And the answer is literally no from a slew of Republicans. Here's what that sounds like from one Republican, Carrie Lake, who's running for governor of Arizona. And this is the very real exchange that happened during an interview with Dana Bash of CNN. Dana Bash said, Will you accept the results of the election in your election? Which is such good word. Just will you elections in your fucking election? Are we doing elections? Here's the response from Lake. Can we talk about the issues, please? Bash, will you accept the results of your election? Lake, I'm not going to lose the election. Bash, my question is, will you accept the results of your election in November? Lake, I'm going to win the election and I will accept that result. Bash, if you lose, though, will you accept that? Lake, I'm going to win. That's Jesus. actually the exchange on cool. CNN. Wow. Cool. And she's probably going to win, too. Is this again? So, it's, all right. So I love yeah, the leading. way that she like started off pretending, you know, the continuation of democracy was fluff. Right. It's okay. (laughs) Enough about this rule of law bullshit. Can we talk about real issues like middle school litter boxes for a change? (laughs) Yeah. And yet somehow half this fucking country is like, yeah, but milk is 20 cents more a gallon. This is a toughie. (laughs) Yep. Here we are. And just to give you an idea of how divorced from reality we've become in half our major political parties. These are two headlines about that same Biden speech. From the New York Times, Biden warns that big lie Republicans imperil American democracy. And from Fox News, Biden ridiculed for despicable speech on, air quotes, threat to democracy. This is what delusion looks like. And uh, 
Yes, it is, but the meta cell phone thing yes. was by accident. <laughs> yeah. That's not what they're going for. At this point, all Fox News headlines fit perfectly as a caption for that meme where the guy's pointing himself in the mirror. <laughs> 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 okay, so point being, vote tomorrow point. if you haven't already. Yes, American democracy is in peril, but the election still counts as far as we know. Granted, okay, Joe Biden is technically not the president because of 1835 maritime law, but he is <laughs> physically in the White House. That happened. But if we lose the Senate, it's almost like he's not in the White House. Fucking vote. Okay, hey, uh, just quick thing. You remember, what was it called? Uh, the, the Dobbs uh, Dobbs thing that happened? I know it was like a million years ago, but try to summon the energy, if you wouldn't mind, based on just that, if nothing else. That'd be great. <sighs> and on that note, I guess this is a good segue. We're going to toss things over to a quick word from our sponsor, BetterHelp. This episode is brought to you by BetterHelp. Hey, podcast listener. You know, we've talked a lot about the benefits of therapy here on The Skeptocrat. Since they've become an advertiser, we've had literally dozens of listeners reach out to tell us that BetterHelp Online Therapy was a great way of getting help for them. Therapists are trained to help you figure out the cause of challenging emotions and learn productive coping skills, which makes therapy the closest thing to a guided tour of the complex engine called you. But today, the day before Election Day, I thought we'd remind you of one more thing a BetterHelp therapist might help you do, and that's going no contact with the shitty people in your life. As the world's largest therapy service, BetterHelp has matched 3 million people with professionally licensed and vetted therapists available 100% online. Plus, it's affordable. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to match with a therapist. If things aren't clicking, you can easily switch to a new therapist anytime. It couldn't be simpler. BetterHelp means no waiting rooms, no traffic, no endless searching for the right therapist. Learn more and save 10% on your first month at BetterHelp.com slash Skeptocrat. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash Skeptocrat. And we're back. Next up in headlines in Legalize Nation news. I have no fucking idea what motivates most of the voters in this country. I feel like if you had asked me five years ago what motivates a blue wave of historical significance, overturning Roe versus Wade would have been an option. But nope, people care about gas or p pulling the lever on the right. It's not clear to me, it's not honestly. So in that spirit, if you're lacking the motivation to hit the voting booth next year when the election actually happens, I will kill you with a spear. <laughs> <laughs> Legalization is on the ballot in Arkansas, Maryland, Missouri, North Dakota, and South Dakota, proving once and for all that the Dakotas can't tell the difference between themselves either. <laughs> <laughs> it seems like a no-brainer that it makes huge amounts of money for the state to legalize, obviously, often for public education that's woefully underfunded. But then again, you know, that means kids learn liberal propaganda like slavery was bad, mm -hmm. so... Pros and cons for lots of people. That's yeah. actually where we are. Right. No, right. You, you, you've got the risk of students uh, thinking that America is a racist country and you lose a law that disproportionately jails black people for a crime that white people commit far more often. It's so for conservatives, this is a lose-lose. <laughs> exactly. Uh. So if approved, those states would join the 19 states and also Washington, D.C., where recreational use is technically legal. But these bills are far from perfect, as anyone who saw... No illusions, tear-stained, heartbroken face standing outside the dispensaries that weren't open last time he was in New Jersey can attest. <laughs> Passing a bill and getting legal weed into dispensaries can take years. Plus, yeah. these bills often carve out rules about who can and can't grow weed, leading to money ending up in the pockets of powerful cultivation lobbyists and not into the state's economy at all. Hell, the Arkansas bill dedicates a portion of the proceeds from legal weed to go to law enforcement. Yeah. Yeah. Well, because they won't be able to write bullshit citations for having a gram of weed in your pocket. And that fucks up their whole business yeah. model as a police department. So, you know, it's only fair that they get a little share of this tax money from weed. Yeah. No. Yeah. But to be clear to those adventurous potheads like myself that heard 19 states and thought you were falling way behind, um, only 11 <laughs> of those states actually have recreational dispensaries at this point. So, so fucking eight of the states and D.C., I believe, still have a hybrid system where it's technically legal to own weed as long as nobody grows it or sells it or gives it away. <laughs> 
You can conjure it. Yes. You can find it in a box. Well, like there's a lot of that. Like at DC, you can't sell it, so it's like you know, why don't you buy this nickel for twenty five dollars? Yes, that's what, that's yeah, what right. we did in Jersey, the gifting program. Yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. I have a lot of stickers. I bought a lot of stickers. <laughs> One last thing about these possible bills uh, that I just had to mention: in most of the states, uh, the personal allotment for weed is around one ounce for personal possession, but for no reason that I could find an explanation for Missouri's proposed personal use allotment is three ounces. Nice. And look, I, I know there's probably like a good reason for this and it's probably like actually motivated by like good social justice stuff. But I couldn't help but picture Missouri selling weed in like big gulp containers. <laughs> <with the flying James>. <laughs> <laughs> Either way, if you do want to get your giant head-sized bag of weed in Missouri, <laughs> head to the polls tomorrow. And hey, why not save democracy by voting for a Democrat, however imperfect, while you're there? Just a thought. That'd be great. There you go. There you go. Bonus, your state gets on the potential live show list as soon as you legalize. That's that's all it takes. Also, fun fact, you can't fit three ounces into a big gulp. Not quite. It's uh, no. just so everybody knows. I feel like you could fit three right. ounces. Into- if you I jam f- it really hard, you just squish it maybe. Challenge? But, like, I, feel like you could, I feel like I could fit three ounces. I, cut, <laughs> cut to me smoking a little bit going like, no, I've almost got it small enough to close the lid. If you bring Noah three ounces of weed to our Christmas tacular in December, <laughs> he will fit it into, fit it into a yeah, lot of things. <laughs> Three ounces in a big gulp. That's Noah's first album when he comes out yes. with a solo album. And in architectural foul news, the upshot of the Trump administration's corruption, as Eli pointed out years ago, is that it provided an effective, if terrifying, series of civics lessons, as the majority of us learned for the first time things like who the Secretary of Education was or who was running the Department of Housing and Urban Development. And because the nation is still suffering from a lingering case of Trump appointees, those lessons aren't over yet, apparently. To wit, I just learned that there's a position called architect of the Capitol, whose job is to oversee the Capitol grounds and the day-to-day operations of the building itself. And I learned that when the guy that Trump appointed to the position got called out by the Office of Inspector General for a hilariously over-the-top series of ethics violations, which include billing the taxpayer for his daughter's gas and pretending to be a cop to avenge her boyfriend's fender. (laughs) Okay. Well, something for Herschel Walker to fall back on. (laughs) It doesn't work out. (laughs) God damn it. 538 is showing Trump winning tomorrow. That's, tomorrow that's somehow. Not, I don't even know what's going on. I think I get it. I, no, no. I actually think I get it. Right wingers think they're automatically cops because they're fascists, right? Oh. Someone just needs to explain it's not an inverse property. I get it. Right? Yeah, okay. It's, it's not a Cretans and Liars <laughs> situation. So, yeah. So, so this is the story of J. Brett Blanton. A name so ex- yeah, it is so fucking <laughs> Caucasian that I can't oh, like I almost can't help but add the third to it when I say it out loud, right? Beauregard, uh, Beauregard, <laughs> Beauregard, <laughs> Bethesda, yeah, Quinselberry, <laughs> so, Blanton, she, Beauregard, the nineteenth. So yeah, so J. Brett Blanton uh, was appointed to the one hundred seventy-two thousand dollar a year job uh, in early twenty twenty by Donald Trump, and immediately started engaging in a level of grift that would be historic by any standard except Trump appointee. Uh, According to the October 26th report by the Inspector General's office, Blanton engaged in a series of, quote, administrative, ethical and policy violations, end quote. And while they're not exactly a law enforcement agency, the report noted that they also identified, quote, evidence of criminal violations throughout their investigation, end quote. Okay, but that's what's so incredible about Trump appointees, right? Our system is filled with perfectly legal kickbacks and bribery yeah. and benefits, and the idiots cannot stop doing crimes <laughs> for way less money anyway. Right, yes, for nothing. <laughs> Just insider trade. It's so easy yes. when you have that. Inf- God Why damn would he it. charge us for the snacks? You right. never get caught for that. <laughs> right. <laughs> So so what kind of fraud are we talking about? Well, they start with the fact that he and his family lugged about 20,000 extra miles in his government-issued SUV. 20,000? Uh, 20,000, yeah. Yeah, so yeah, so these miles, which they billed the taxpayer for gas over, included a family trip to Florida, numerous trips to a nearby craft brewery. He also apparently let his daughter just cruise around in it with her friends, an arrangement that his daughter described as free gas. She described it that way, by the way, 
two OIG investigators. <laughs> How does that happen? Yeah, so that's the free gas truck, and uh, that right there, that's my dad's bag with a dollar sign on the yes. side. I don't know if that's what <laughs> Sorry, what was the question? Yeah. Who are you? <laughs> Can we come in? Um, so, yeah. <laughs> he killed Kennedy. <laughs> well, I don't know what's happening. The, the report also, by the way, it also includes one instance of said SUV, quote, swerving through a Tyson's Corner, Virginia, Walmart parking garage at 65 miles per hour, end quote. Okay. So some nerdling who was the architect of the Capitol before was like, all right, so uh, here's your government issue and you're doing donuts with it around me while yes. I speak to you. Okay. <laughs> uh, I think I'll skip the other matters on my clipboard. Uh, <laughs> so, so, okay, but, but so just driving the approximate distance between here and geosynchronous orbit on the public dime wasn't the limit of his corruption, right? So there's also the notable instance of impersonating a police officer see his vehicle is provided i guess by the capitol police so it has the lights and sirens built into it but that doesn't mean he gets to pull people over with him well when somebody hit his daughter's boyfriend's car he apparently forgot about that stipulation and went on a good old-fashioned high-speed chase which included by the way what missed, yeah he misled local law enforcement called him in and said yeah no i'm an off-duty cop you got to chase this guy this is a ruse that he would keep up all the way through this shit going to court okay I feel like the cops should be able to sniff that one out right? somehow. Do so they not have a system I'm, I'm for that? The system of checks. <laughs> Fuck. Some guys just like, yeah, I'm a real cop. I don't know why I said real. I'm a cop from the <laughs> next town over. It's in Canada. Don't don't check on it. I need you to help me chase a child yes. really quick. <laughs> and they did it. Yep. They sure the fuck did. Now, obviously, a ton of people in Congress are calling for the dude's job, but apparently he can only be fired through the executive branch. And for whatever reason, as of this writing, Biden hasn't fired him. But given the scathing language of the report, including the charge that Blanton, quote, misled and provided false information to investigators on multiple occasions and, quote, violated every pillar the OIG operates under, including theft, fraud, waste and abuse, end quote. I kind of suspect that fired isn't going to be the worst outcome he suffers from this shit. <laughs> And speaking of wishing you'd covered your ass when you had the chance, it's time for a word from this week's other sponsor, Policy Genius. Nope, nope, still bad. Okay, still bad. Hey guys, why is Eli chewing tinfoil? We're testing if uncomfortable things are actually great. Okay, I'm sure I'm going to regret asking this, but why? Because of how easy and painless it was to get life insurance with Policy Genius. What's Policy Genius? Policy Genius was built to modernize the life insurance industry. Their technology makes it easy to compare life insurance quotes from the top companies like AIG and Prudential in just a few clicks to find your lowest price. With Policy Genius, you can find insurance policies that start at just $70 per month for $500,000 of coverage. And Policy Genius has licensed agents who can help you find options that offer coverage in as little as a week and avoid unnecessary medical exams. They're not incentivized to recommend one insurer or another, so you can trust their guidance. There are no added fees and your personal info is private. No wonder they have thousands of five-star reviews on Google and Trustpilot. Okay, but do either of you have a personal endorsement? I sure do, no illusions. I used Policy Genius to find the life insurance that I still have today when they became a sponsor. They found me a great price and walked me through every step of the way. That's why I, Eli Bosnick, personally endorse Policy Genius. Your loved ones deserve a financial safety net, and you deserve a smarter way to find and buy it. Just head to policygenius.com or click the link in the description to get your free life insurance quotes and see how much you could save. That's policygenius.com. All right. Well, so what are you guys going to try next? Uh, we were thinking we were going to try to have a nuanced discussion on Twitter. Ooh, mm -hmm. I would stick with the tinfoil. And we're back. Next up in headlines, in separating the tweet from the chaff news. Nice. Donald Trump is dead, and that is my sincerely held truth <laughs> that I learned on Twitter last week. Yep. That's real, sincerely held. And it's all thanks to their new CEO, professional electric-powered sharp thing magnate and <laughs> South African emerald baron Elon Musk, who officially took over Twitter last week. His vision is mostly based on making Twitter the mecca of disinformation technology by banning all banning because 
every voice is useful. No, it's not. A fucking course it's not. Nope. You should ban some things. But in response to the new boss, a bunch of people decided to test his philosophy. And the hashtag Trump is dead was one of the top trending topics last oh, week. My heart was in my throat when I saw it. <laughs> okay, but so until he actually starts allowing racial slurs, the most offensive thing he'll have done with Twitter is that dumbass sink joke that he made on the way in, right? Like he carried a sink into an office for that. He basically <laughs> did it somebody behind him passing out cards that explain the fucking joke. <laughs> Elon Musk is basically if that boss that thinks he's hilarious was suddenly put in charge of one nuclear bomb. <laughs> it's, it's not everything, but it's like it's way too much power way too much yep. for that guy. Yep. Absolutely correct. Okay, but in fairness to Elon Musk, and okay, I really don't like doing this, but in fairness to Elon Musk, he did have a meeting last week with civil rights groups to get their input about the importance of curtailing hate speech and disinformation on major platforms like Twitter. That included representatives from the NAACP and the Anti-Defamation League and a few others. And according to several of those reps, Musk did seem to be interested in preventing Twitter from being a hate amplifier. And we're done being fair, because seriously, that's a good meeting he had, but minutes later, he tweeted an article from the Santa Monica Observer that said Nancy Pelosi's husband got attacked with a hammer because he was drunk and in a fight with a male prostitute. Turns out that was incorrect. Huh. That's not what happened. Yeah. No, I'm sure I'm sure his opening question in that meeting was, so would you guys agree that you are now some of my best friends? Um, <laughs> <laughs> you don't have any emeralds for me. This is fucking crazy. All right, not what I'm used to. <laughs> and look, people, this isn't hard to understand, okay? We didn't teach anyone who can make eye contact how to code, and now every major form of communication and information <laughs> transference is controlled by a chat room from 1997. Yeah. That's what we did. Yeah, our bad. Yeah, we also got a new policy proposal from Elon Musk regarding the blue check mark. Mm -hmm. According to a report from The Verge, there's been internal correspondence among Twitter execs recently about charging verified users $20 a month to keep their status and their blue check mark. In response to that news, author Stephen King tweeted exact words, fuck that, they should pay me. And that's when Elon Musk, the business savvy genius of industry, replied, okay, what about $8 a month? How about that? <laughs> I know, I know. Because, you know, the, we could all agree that the biggest problem with Twitter was how easy it was to verify your sources. Way to fight back, Elon. Yeah, next up, two-factor <laughs> authentication approval for just a nickel. <laughs> no cell phone required. Musk also added that a subscription fee is the only way to defeat the bots and the trolls, which is true in the sense that Everyone's going to stop using Twitter if it costs a bunch of yeah. money and the bots and the trolls won't matter at that point. But that's not what he meant. He meant like nonsense, nonsense, brr, 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 pay me. I want you to pay me. And also tacitly meant I'm not willing to ban trolls and bots because Ayn Rand told me not to yep. or something like that. Also worth noting, advertisers have already started canceling their business with Twitter because they don't want their ad showing up next to a bunch of slur words, which yeah. is very reasonable. Right, well, and also worth noting, all of those people that he met with at that very productive meeting still recommended to advertisers that they do, right? And, yeah. and Musk's response to all of this is trying to shame the fucking advertisers because nothing screams, come hither, dear advertisers, like showing that you're not above publicly shaming the ones when they leave, right? <laughs> yeah. I know how I'll convince people this platform isn't just for edgelords and harassment. I'll stick a bunch of edgelord harassers on right. them. Yes. So, yeah, this, this whole thing's going to be fun to watch in the sense that Elon Musk is failing. That, that's fun. Mm -hmm. He took over a week ago. He's already steering the company about as well as a Tesla on autopilot <laughs> on a frozen <laughs> pond full of pregnant people and Nobel laureate puppies or whatever. Or just a regular road. Yeah. If the comment works <laughs> really. either way. Yeah, but to be fair, his his chief competition is Facebook. I, I don't I don't think anybody would argue it's being better managed at the moment. Yeah. <laughs> also, just if I can throw one last thing in about this story, I hear a lot of people on Twitter asking, like, "Hey, where are we going after Twitter?" And if I may be so bold, what if we just did it? Because Twitter is bad. It was bad for us as individuals. It was bad for society. Mm. Let's just get off meth. 
without figuring out what drug we're going to do next, huh? Oh, oh, okay, Tom. No, that's no. fair. That is, that is <laughs> fair. <laughs> Vulgaritis good nerve flu. <laughs> and in the Bareback Contessa news, as we teased at the top of the show, Andrew Torres will be here in just a moment to give you the kind of in-depth and useful explanation that's made him such a pillar in our community of skeptics. But you're not going to remember a single fucking word he says. No, your mind, like mine, will be entirely consumed by this next story. Namely, that Ina Garden, the Barefoot Contessa's husband, sends her dirty texts on the reg. Okay, the more wholesome the public image the more graphic I imagine stuff. So this is like right in in what I expected. See, I, I'm I'm pretty sure I wouldn't care about this even if I knew who you were talking about. So, okay. so <laughs> this news comes to us as the bareback contessa appeared on Drew Barrymore's daytime um, talk show. Eli, I, I think you mean barefoot contessa. Right? Ep, 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 let me finish. Uh, she <laughs> explains I? that Jeffrey sends her daily quote love texts, adding that sometimes they go astray, saying quote. My dear friend, who's also my publicist, he sent a text to her and he meant it for me. And he said, you're going to be delicious tonight. And it went to her. She was like, whoa. She sent back, I don't think this was meant for me. End quote. Oh, sorry, ladies. Yeah, sorry about that. Was, that was supposed to be for, um, for, for both of you? Nothing. What? No. <laughs> Sorry, no that, was, that, was just, that was obviously just for, for Ina. Ina. Yeah, so I know the name of my wife. <laughs> so, yeah, no, as, as Heath and I have learned repeatedly, the that was meant for Anna excuse doesn't always mean that the offer's off the table. You know? That's true. That is true. So, yeah, just in case you were ever watching the Barefoot Contessa on the Food Network and thinking to yourself, man, that Jeffrey's a lucky fella, what with his... Cornish hens and sweet potato crocheted <laughs> pies. Well, now you know what he does to earn those pies. He eats ass, podcast listener. Hard. So, <laughs> yeah. Next time you come home to cold mashed potatoes or a frozen Marie calendar pie, ask yourself, hey, when's the last time I got all up in that beehole like Jeffrey, the hero <laughs> America needs? Oh, okay, so she does a cooking show then. He's a cooking show. Yeah. There it okay, is. Okay, all yep. right. Yep, got it. <laughs> and that's going to do it for the headlines of hard hitting news on the eve of election. Day. <laughs> Thanks for that, Eli. But before we wrap it up, we have a special report from Andrew Torres, ESQT Pie. Andrew, welcome back. <laughs> you know, seeing that written out, I, I wasn't sure how that was going to be pronounced. Now I get it. So thanks for having me, Heath. That goes on the card from now on. I, right? I'm, I'm, I'm borrowing that for life. Andrew, Andrew, did yeah? you hear about the barefoot Contessa getting her snooze smonched? Did you hear that I, part? You know, Eli, as someone who watches a lot of the Food Network, this was really a known fact. Like, you should, uh, <laughs> I guess what I'm saying is you should get yourself invited to one of those parties she throws in the Hamptons, if you know what I mean. <laughs> that was that was my part of the podcast. That's mm-hmm. what I delivered. Excellent job. You helped. Yes, yes you we did. We all so, bring something. With Election Day coming up tomorrow, I understand you have some advice for us on how to process and interpret election returns as they come in. So I was going to go with my normal scream into the void, but I would love to hear some other ideas. Andrew, what were you thinking? So look, screaming into the void is a perfectly rational thing to do. And I get right. Because look, Mm -hmm. if modern history is any guide and, you know, by modern, I mean, last hundred plus years. So, you know, post the age of mutton chops. And that's about right. (laughs) In that time period, the party holding the White House gets killed, absolutely destroyed in their first midterm election. Right. Bill Clinton's first term, 1994, the Republicans won eight Senate seats. 54 seats in the House that um, pretty much ended Clinton's ability to pass health care and gave us, you know, Speaker Newt Gingrich, the contract mm. with America, the Defense of Marriage Act, you know, good yeah, stuff. Well, at least going into this one, we don't have high inflation and an unpopular precedent. <laughs> <laughs> it says something that the only way Americans are predictable is that they're unhappy with their choices from two years ago. <laughs> Like that's, <laughs> yeah. Always, yeah. That's it. And it was arguably even worse in 2010. Republicans uh-huh. yeah. picked up 63 seats in the House, seven in the Senate, helped Mitch McConnell inch closer to his goals of completely shutting down the government and making Obama a one-term president. So I guess if that's where you're setting the bar, it's 
It's not going to be that bad? I, it's not going to be that bad. It's not going to be close to that bad, right? So so if, okay. and, and put a pin in this, if the polling numbers are correct, the Democrats are probably going to narrowly lose the House. They're going to retain a fragile Kirsten Cinema, Joe Manchin addled lead in the Senate, right? 50-50. And, and pick up some state governorships, okay? So look, that's bad. That, that That's not good for the next two years. It's not good for our country. But it'd actually be the second best midterm election result in modern history behind only 2002 when, you know, the country was still bandwagoning for George W. Bush and the aftermath of 9-11. Right. So this could be almost as good as the thing that led to the Iraq War. (laughs) Is it too late to do a 9-11 and click (laughs) on Because, Andrew, there are whole states I'm willing to let go at this point. These are jokes. Okay. These are jokes. We move on. I kind of like Eli's thing. I like Eli's thing that was uh, Andrew saying it was a joke. It was a joke. We're moving on. The fascist insurrectionist party winning the House, probably not great. That means not only the end of the January 6th committee, but probably new investigations like every week into Benghazi and Mm -hmm. Hunter Biden's laptop porn and the Fast and the Furious and Probably a fact-finding committee on impeaching Joe Biden, right? Oh, so that's oh, what we're going to get from the House? All of those things. And don't forget, 10% of our party will still somehow blame Biden for not using his, I don't know, magic wish powers to pass universal health care. So I, bad. But, but in a holding action kind of way, so long as the Democrats maintain the Senate, Mitch McConnell can't spend two years denying Joe Biden judgeships and even cabinet appointees. So, yeah, l- sure. look, get ready sure. for two years of executive orders, followed by a close presidential race between the, as you said, fascist insurrectionist party and the yep. party of not that. Of something else. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That shouldn't okay. be close, but yeah. Great. Holding pattern. Can't wait for the holding pattern victory. So it's weird to make signs that have holding power on them. <laughs> yeah. It's the chant is not exciting yeah. the way you want it oh, to be. Oh, dang. Pat. What do no. we want? <laughs> Nothing. Yeah. When do we want it? Never. <laughs> Four years ago. Yeah. Okay. Well, speaking of which, why should I be excited to watch the slow death of democracy on Tuesday <laughs> leading to a victory holding pattern. I, okay, so presumably you're not excited about that. But but before I go all optimist prime on you, it, it, it's important to calibrate why this is likely to be a bad night for Democrats in the House, right? Because, okay, here's the way to think about it. Imagine you have to flip 20 coins and only four of them can come up heads, right? That's bad. That's what the House looks like right now, right? Democrats are defending 20 to 30 seats where the character of the district, right, RVI of zero to R plus one or D plus one or whatever, the polling, the underlying demographics all say, eh, there's probably a 50-50 toss-up. But here's the thing, right? These are not 30 separate coin flips that are all independent of each other. These are events that interrelate. Right. It's like if each coin hit another coin and then... Depending on where that coin hit, it would... Sorry, you were going somewhere, Andrew. Yeah, no, I tried to. I I tried to, Eli. It's really... It's a tough one. Coin dominoes. (laughs) So think about it this way, Eli. This is the first election since 2016 where Trump is not on the ballot, right? And Trump absolutely scrambled the polls, as we all know. Thank you, 538, right? Likely voter screens have been trying to catch up. They, They missed again in 2020. So... If the numbers are what they look like, we're, we're, we're headed for the bad night that we've discussed. But suppose, just suppose, that the polls are underestimating Democratic strength by just 2%, right? That is 2% of angry, MAGA hat-wearing idiots who just stay the fuck home instead of, you know, trudging out to their stupid polling place to vote for some chump they've never heard of. Well, to, to cast a vote that they've been told will be stolen anyway, right? Yeah, it, that's it, new exactly. to this election, too. <laughs> Yeah, and if that happens, those close races aren't coin flips anymore. And and Democrats could conceivably run or almost run the table and hold the House. But better yet, a 2% error means that the Democrats will probably net three more Senate seats, right? That means Eli's buddy Tim Ryan in Ohio, yeah. <laughs> Sherry Beasley in North Carolina, it, along with John Fetterman in, in, in Pennsylvania, right? That would give us a mansion and cinema-proof Senate. So, you know, could polls be overestimating Republican support without Trump on the ballot by just 2%? That seems uh, super plausible to me. 
Okay. For listeners at home, Eli has pasted the "Don't Give Me Hope" Hawkeye gif <laughs> into our notes. Just, I'm not. I'm not sure uh, how he was hoping that you at home would know that that was there, but just <laughs> en- enjoy the fact that it is. Okay. No. Cool story, Andrew. What if the polls are underestimating Republican support by two percent? Uh, all right. Sensible negatron. But here's the thing. If that happens, it makes almost no difference, right? Okay, so yes, at the far end, that could send the Warnock-Walker race to a runoff. Uh, But, like, we're probably still going to win the runoff, right? Like that, And and Democrats will lose 25 seats in the House, and you'll get, you know, some goofball, mega-hat-wearing idiots in that. But, like, it won't change the direction of the next two years at all. So, in, in a way, like... (laughs) <laughs> by by setting our sights as low as we've set them. Right? It's kind of cool. all upside from there. Great. No, good job with the framing. So what do we look for tomorrow night? All right. Here's what I think you need to do. First, you're going to have to keep your shoulders up early because you're going to turn on MSNBC at like 4.30 in the afternoon when nobody knows anything, right? Coverage is going to start at like 6, and the only polls that close at 6 are like half of Kentucky and parts of India. Nothing will come in. And then 7 o'clock is going to come in, and the early returns in Georgia are going to make you not happy, right? Because Stacey Abrams is is losing, and, and she may be getting killed in the early numbers because Fulton County reports late, right? So it, it could be 7.30 p.m., and you're looking at like, Herschel Walker with a lead in Georgia and Stacey Abrams losing by double digits and a bunch of Republican House wins. And you're going to want to throw yourself off the building. And and none of it means anything. Right. Yeah. Save the good weed. You're going to need it later. <laughs> <laughs> or just have like a full 24 hours worth of the good weed. <laughs> yes. Yes. Ooh, two votes. All, all, all good advice. Assuming you were in a state in which uh, it is legal for you to smoke weed. That is the official position of Puzzle in a Thunderstorm LLC. Sure, no. Whatever. Oh, my God. You're yeah. such a narc. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Can you wedgie someone on a podcast? <laughs> Eli just threatened to to wedgie me. That's just I just want to I just want to make that clear. Eli threatened to wedgie me. All right, it was a joke. Andrew, my lawyer, told me it's okay. yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. So what the smart kids are going to be looking at at around the seven thirty mark is the Virginia House race. Okay, Virginia should probably wind up nine to five Democrats. Okay. This is the first of, of those coin flips, right? This is Virginia's second district. It's Elaine Luria, L-U-R-I-A, and she's facing off against Jennifer Kiggins. If Republicans win this race or they're winning it at 730, it's going to be a long night. If it's close, if Luria is ahead, then we, we might be looking for the upside scenario. So Virginia 2 at, at about 730, check in right before you know the polls start to close. All right, we're looking at Virginia 2, around 7.30, then what? Yeah, and then polls are going to close in Ohio and North Carolina, and this is our first test if Democrats are outperforming expectations, okay? And uh, we just said Tim Ryan, Sherry Beasley in the Senate. There's also the first Democratic... Sorry, ooh, <laughs> there's also the first Democratic pickup opportunity in, in each of these states, right? So look at Ohio's first district, long-standing Republican Steve Shabbat. He was on the Clinton impeachment team, right? Like, I mean, he's been in the House forever. And he has consistently trailed Democrat Greg Landsman throughout the entire race. Come on, Cincy, make it happen. Yeah. Do it. <laughs> <laughs> and also uh, check out the 13th district in North Carolina that pits Democrat Wiley Nickel, uh, who is facing a... 26-year-old, never held office before, ma- self-described mega warrior, uh, ex-college football player named Bo Hines. Come so. on, people. You could have Congressman Wiley Nickel, right? Like, <laughs> the, the name alone should be enough for you. He sounds like a prospector from a fucking Hanna-Barbera cartoon. <laughs> <laughs> will be my favorite Democratic member of Congress. Yeah. I also want to point out that we will be uh, recording Citation Needed at that time. So, folks, if you're listening to Citation Needed in two weeks and the second half of the episode is way low energy and weepy, <laughs> now you know why. You know why. <laughs> so, look, here's a bottom line. A lot of the news is not going to be good early, but it's not until 
eight o'clock when a whole bunch of polls close and we start to see the results on all of these coin flips that that you really know where this race is going. So anybody who's like br- broken out the bad scotch at like seven, th- like, no, you're panicking too early, right? And so on tomorrow's opening Don't arguments, buy doers either. <laughs> yeah. Why would you have it? Why would you do that? that? That makes no sense, Scott. So listen to tomorrow's opening arguments. We'll tell you exactly when you're allowed to panic and when you're not. Okay. Of a scotch in hand at 8 p.m. Eastern. Got it. One last question. Are we looking at any blue shift scenarios this year, like in 2020? What states are going to take a while to come in? Yeah. So we're really looking at like a 2020 do-over level of being multiple days out because a couple of reasons. I mean, number one is states now have lots more practice with handling mail-in voting. A bunch of states repealed their very stupid passed only in 2020 laws that prevented you from counting any mail-in votes until all of the in-person votes were counted, right? That's still the case in Pennsylvania because, you know, whatever, it's, it's Pennsylvania. But most states got rid of that, right? So Pennsylvania and Michigan are still going to be slow, but um, in Pennsylvania, like Fetterman and Shapiro should be outside the margin of error, so it, it shouldn't matter. And same thing, we go through the Michigan races, but like the, the same thing, it is unlikely that control of the House is going to come down to uh, to Michigan. Michigan is one of those states where, for example, uh, Alyssa Slotkin uh, had, uh, that's a the Democratic incumbent, uh, Liz Cheney went out to Michigan's seventh district and campaigned for Alyssa Slotkin. It was basically like, I don't agree with her on anything, but like I serve with her on the House January 6th committee. This is a good person and a dedicated public servant, and you shouldn't kick them out of office. Which strikes me as like exactly the kind of pitch you want for the Republicans in your district, right? Liz Cheney did that in Arizona too. She's yeah. like, I've never voted for a Democrat, but like this would be one of the times. Yeah. Because yeah. You know, pure evil on the other side and a good person here. It, it absolutely. So, you know, it's possible that things will drag on. But, but, but keep in mind, if it drags on, that's also a good thing, right? Because it's fewer banked coin flip losses. So lots of ways for things to go not terrible. <laughs> That'd be my bottom line. All right. Holding pattern. <laughs> USA. What are we holding? holding pattern. pattern. <laughs> cool. <laughs> and uh, again, Check out opening arguments for a full election deep dive coming up tomorrow on Election Day. And uh, start practicing O Canada like I've been doing. Just <laughs> Safe in case. Bet. You never know. Thanks. Safe Can't bet. hurt. And on that note, we're going to close it out. Thanks to No Illusions. Thanks to Eli Bosnick. Thanks to Andrew Torres. And thanks to all the listeners who liked us on Facebook, followed us on Twitter, and sent us feedback on the other various internets. Please keep doing that. Please keep listening. And please keep telling your friends. And if you find the naive stupidity of our giving away a free show business model to be oddly charming, please feel free to send us gifts of money at our donation page at patreon.com slash skeptocrat. Just like all the new generous donors who will have their genitals complimented next time around. And whether or not you're feeling financially benevolent like those fine people, if you enjoyed our brand of whimsy and you'd like to hear more dick jokes free of charge, check out our brother and sister shows, The Scathing Atheist, Godawful Movies, D&D Minus, and Citation Needed. Available on Apple Music, Stitcher, all those other podcast apps, or the deep web. We just have one last thing. Let's compliment that penist. Special thanks to Ryan Slonick of Evil Giraffes on Mars. He is the creator of the virtuosic musical stylings you heard today, which were used with permission. You should definitely check him out using the links we'll provide or by Googling the only band called Evil Giraffes on Mars. Until next time, catchphrase sign off. Okay, wait, I have to ask before we go into the ads here, I have to ask, between the three of us, how many dollars in total has been spent on Powerball tickets? Zero for me. Oh, this is is no fun. Zero. (laughs) God damn it. I could, I don't know, you guys, are. do we get to divide mine by three now? Because I think that's much more reasonable. Yes, we sure do. Between the three of us. Uh, They're $2 a week, right? What? What? They're two dollars a week, Powerball. I don't like. I don't know.
I don't know how much it is a ticket. Just how much two. total money did you spend? I don't. On I don't have a fucking. Re- Actually, I do. I can look in my. I can look in my checkbook. App. So wait. So wait. So Powerball is just a regular like budgeted expense for you. I mean, it's not. Yikes! It's not budgeted. Budgeted would, would <laughs> imply. So I was just. And, I just. You have a child because there's like the ridiculous like one point nine I guess billion dollar. Jackpot. Now, I, I didn't mean like lifetime. You don't have to figure out. <laughs> oh, you mean today? Like but this I, week? I, I mean for this drawing or like the oh, last drawing in this drawing. Two dollars. Oh, okay. All right. Well, that's okay. better than I was thinking it was going to be. Two dollars. So, yeah. Oh, by averaging tickets. sixty-seven cents a piece. Really, it's not. I don't. Not bad at all. I don't know why, but here's the sentence that was about to come out of my mind: Buying multiple tickets is stupid. <laughs> Yeah, two is twice as dumb as one. No, so look, I get that. I un- I absolutely understand just doing the two dollars every every week or whatever, because you want to perpetually live in a fantasy where there's some way that you get a billion dollars, right? Just suddenly, yep. right? I I get that. I, I if totally you can afford the two dollars for that enjoyment of anticipation, fine. Right? Yeah. yeah if you, like literally any other strategy of trying to turn that two dollars into more money would be more successful right like where it's more yeah. likely to be successful <laughs> you could stand outside the grocery store where i buy lotto tickets going anyone want to trade two dollars for a billion dollars and statistically have the same amount of success you could buy dogecoin and that would be a much better investment much better yeah for sure absolutely much more likely to pay off yeah no i just i remembered this um quote from designing women which was a Great fucking show. This is an under underrated uh, TV show where 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 Julia Sugarbaker is talking about lottery, and she says, "Yeah, not enough people seem to realize that you know the one in twenty seven million billion odds are approximately the same as the odds of a gorilla just parachuting through your roof and handing you that money." <laughs> um, so, and that, like, honestly, that quote has probably saved me a thousand dollars over the last thirty years. You know, it's just like, yeah, but you know, <laughs> the odds that I'm just gonna find it, like a plane is going to have crashed in the woods. Woods I'm work, uh, walking through that has drug billions in it is equally likely to me winning the 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 lottery. And if I if I walk around looking for drug planes, at least I'm getting some exercise, you know. And for like nine hundred dollars, you could rent the gorilla at least that part of it, and it'd be fun. Sure, is that? Can you rent a gorilla for nine hundred bucks? I would thank you. I, I was going to say it's weird that you had gorilla renting pricing like right off the top of your head. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Eli, first of all, you know you're my gorilla renting guy. That's true. Do you no, I not do have, have that a, available? Have but also, guy, yeah. and yeah. and also, it's if you want him to parachute, it's so much more than that. so much more. You got to send that's him an, to that's the an extra. school. That's an extra, <laughs> right? He's got to do the first one. Right, he's got to get the. To a, yep, yep. The high teenager. Yeah, it's a whole yeah, thing. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And he's got to he's got to do the little thing in the in the room with the big fan first, and they never like that. No. Send me a quote. Just so I know. No, I'll, we'll collect a couple of bids. I put it on Upwork, and we'll see. Okay, what we perfect. <laughs> we should do that. That should be a Patreon goal or a, or a Bulgari for Charity goal. We'll throw a gorilla out of a plane. Well, no, no. That we should just put that out as a as a thing on like you know Fiverr or whatever. Does anybody have sure. a parachuting gorilla that they can? Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. See what kind. Hey, of Hey, if I win the lotto this week, we can do it. <laughs> we can do whatever the fuck we want. You will parachute a gorilla through my roof to hand me a million dollars. And you'll pay yourself to fuck our dead dads. Yep. Yeah, there you go. Well, Noah has an alive one. My, my dad, yeah, my dad is... Um, Either way. He could probably go for it. He probably he couldn't find the words to say no. He's, he's, no, he's like, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Jesus Christ, dude. <laughs> What's that? Um, I want to tell this fella here to... Uh, oh, gosh, it's on the tip of my tongue. Woof. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> So better help ad? Yes, yeah, better, so right, yeah, better, better help. Better help ad. Maybe that maybe that outtake just ends in a, <laughs> a sudden <laughs> The preceding podcast is a production of Puzzle and a Thunderstorm LLC, copyright twenty twenty two, all rights reserved.